recognized our seniors this morning in first service, and we had some baptisms, and uh, it was just a, a great first service time. Looking forward to, of course, again, having some time in the Word of God and fellowship, and, and uh, we're going to finish out the book of Galatians chapter number four today, and then we'll go into one of the, one of the all-time phase, if there's, you know, that top ten chapters in the Bible uh, chapter 5 of Galatians might be one of them where it talks, of course, of what the Holy Spirit is all about and a, another layer and another level of what Paul is communicating to the Galatian people and uh, really the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, the conflict that the flesh has with the Spirit. And, and Paul's really teaching all the way through all that. He's teaching it to believers in these churches of Galatia but of course, as you teach through the Bible, you will come in contact with the gospel continually and the different places and pieces of where, of course, uh, it applies to the person that is lost, someone that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior and, and how they need Christ, uh, anybody that's called in the name of the Lord to save them, put their complete faith and trust in Him and Him alone, uh, as those three people up here in the baptismal tank uh, testify, they a little Kara, that was awesome. She just said, what Jesus did for me, I wasn't uh, worthy of it. Uh, he suffered for me. And when I realized that, that I needed only that, oh, that's beautiful coming out of a second grader's mouth. It's powerful. And, uh, and then, of course, with Ashley and Garrett saying the exact same thing, that they knew the baptismal water was a place to testify of what the Lord Jesus Christ had done for them, done for them but that... They truly knew they were born again by what the Word of God says. And uh, they now, as they stood up in there, have said, Hey, I have no problem telling you that I'm born again. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. And uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to all that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And they were saying that with their testimony. Paul the Apostle is saying this to the Galatian people saying, hey, remember when that happened to you? You got the churches started. You became believers. You're born again. Why did you walk away from some of that stuff? What, what were you doing there? I have to keep on coming and I have to keep on telling you and so I've got to break some more stuff down for you and say, hey, now that you're a Christian, now that you're a believer, you don't need to go back into that law pleasure or that religious pleasing way or that man religious legalism uh, uh, package where, hey, that's the way I'm going to live my life. Last week we talked about a affectionately or as Paul was being just really personal about saying, hey, I love you so much, affectionately yours. I want you to stay in the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus alone, affectionately yours. I want you not to change or twist up the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and what grace can do for you and, and mercy can do for you and faith, affectionately yours. And so it was very personal, those last few verses that we covered last week. Well, today I'm going to look at Again, a little bit more of his personal care and love. And, and I'm going to highlight a verse that came out in our study the last, uh, last time we were in there. And referencing this idea that, hey, you receive the truth. You're born again. You're the body of Christ. You have fellowship with the saints. You are in the adoption of Father God, and you also are in the seed of Abraham, the father. And so all of that, I'm going to tell you the truth about it all. If you don't mind, I'm going to tell you straight up how this is. Can I just tell it to you with love? And so I ask you this. How do you handle it when someone who loves you tells you the truth? How do you like it? You like when someone tells you something that you see as Maybe not going on in your life, and that's what Paul said in Galatians 4.16. He said, hey, why do you call me an enemy? Why do you look at me as an enemy when I tell you the truth? Do you see people as an enemy when they tell you the truth spiritually? I'm speaking spiritually speaking. Paul's saying, I want to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you that you can't walk down that avenue. You don't need to walk back into a legalistic life since you got saved out of that. The law is important. But the grace and truth of the Lord Jesus Christ is more important. Okay, so then let me ask you this. Does the truth cause you to treat that person as an enemy? 
So think of something that really hits your heart. Somebody tells you that your hair doesn't look very good today. Is that what we're talking about? No. Somebody might come to you and say, hey, I see where you're, you're, you're talking about some things that aren't in the Bible. You're doing some things that aren't of a Christian. You're living a life that seems to be to please man and not the Lord. Um, I'd ask you just to, to, to consider that we, maybe, maybe we can go in the Bible together. Get away from me. Leave me alone. Are you judging me? I understand that might be the way that we would react, especially if the delivery of the person wasn't done with love. But I did ask earlier, what if someone tells you the truth in love? Because as Paul says here in verse number 20 of Galatians 4, which is part of our message last week when we finished up, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. So remember, as Paul has looked at the people here, he says, hey, I'm concerned of you. I'm, I'm kind of fearful of you. And in my estimation of the way you're living, I say, hey, I stand in doubt of you. Remember, he has said some things like that to them earlier when he said, hey, you know what? I see the way you're walking. And I'm concerned. I am afraid of you, he said in verse number 11, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What are we getting going with this morning? In our study in Galatians, and especially in verse, uh, chapters number 3 and 4, we've seen Paul continue out and say, I have some arguments for grace and I've taught you about how grace covers this, the grace and truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when someone comes to you in grace, in love, and gives you the truth and tells you, hey, this is really, really important, and they don't get it, are you going to give up and stop? On the other side of it, when you receive those words of exhortation, of, of edification, maybe of, of, a, of, of a challenge, maybe in a good way, what do you do? How would you communicate the truth in love so it was received in love? So I'm putting it on both sides. How you receive, what would you do, and then how would you communicate it if you were in Paul's position today? I've mentioned this over our series the last two, three, four weeks in our free to live faith that I'm concerned that we don't speak up in the proper manner with the proper heart over matters that are of the word of God and of doctrine, of the true truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the grace and truth of the gospel, I'm fearful that we're not having enough of those conversations. So let's have those conversations and receive a conversation if someone brings it to you and says, hey, I just want to bring you the truth. I want to tell you the truth. Don't look at me as an enemy. If you do, I hope that you will change your perception of me because I would have you to communicate to me the same way. And we understand with Paul making these arguments for grace that it's really, really imperative and important to him that they see his heart about what the Word of God teaches. We looked at the personal argument from Paul in Galatians 3, 1 through 5. We looked at the scriptural argument from Paul in verses 6 through 14 in chapter 3. We looked at the logical argument for the balance of chapter number 3, and we saw Paul logically break down that the law cannot change the promise. The law is not greater than the promise. Remember, we worked through all of these. Then he hit chapter number 4. And from the very beginning, we saw Paul the apostle again saying, hey, you know what? I'm concerned for you. Do you not know what you have in Jesus? That you were just treated as a servant for a while, as a child, but then in the appointed time of the Father, he said, hey, you are mine, and this appointed time is now, guess what? You're an heir. You're an heir in the Father's lineage. You are an heir, a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are going to be bestowed upon you spiritual blessing after spiritual blessing after spiritual blessing. And as Paul walks through that, he's saying there's a historical argument in the first few verses of chapter number four, and there's a sentimental argument that we looked at last week. So here we are today. 
Here we are today looking at the allegorical. What is it about an allegorical, an allegorical type of argument for grace? Well, maybe we'll put this uh, title of our message up on the screen and have you kind of capture where I'm headed. Because sometimes the truth hurts. And sometimes it's a direct approach. Sometimes it's an affectionately yours approach. And maybe sometimes it's an allegorical approach. An allegory, a parable, a narrative that points out truths with characters that have truth to them, but the characters make believe. In this case, the allegory that Paul's using is based on the truth of two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, and two wives, Hagar and Sarai. And we find out today that in Paul's teaching of this, he quotes the Old Testament. He quotes Genesis 12, excuse me, Genesis 16, Genesis 21. And he really is saying, hey, I know sometimes the truth hurts. I'm going to keep on giving you the truth. I'm going to keep on giving you the truth. And this time, I'm going to try another way. I'm going to try an allegorical approach to it. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you have someone that you've brought the truth to, and you brought the truth to, and you brought the truth to, and you don't, you don't have another approach. You know that the truth hurts them a little bit, maybe, just like it might hurt you if you heard something of truth. And so when someone says, hey, let me give you another approach. Let me take a, a little bit different avenue to get the truth across. You realize that, again, sometimes the truth hurts to hear it, but it's very important to hear the truth. Go with me in verses number 21 down through 31 this morning. And I want to read through this whole thing, the last 11 verses of the chapter. And I want you to pay attention to the allegory. I want you to pay attention to how Paul again is saying, hey, the truth hurts. I'm going to keep on giving you the truth. And today I want to give you an allegorical argument for grace, a narrative, a story that points out a deeper meaning than what you've captured thus far. Maybe Galatians, you'll get it now. Verse 21, he starts out with a question. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Do you not understand what you're getting yourself into? Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a handmaid, bondmaid and the other by a free woman. Consider that theme throughout. There's two sides, two sons, two wives, two people that gave birth to two different people. You know the story. Historically, we realize in verse 23 that Paul's really just bringing back some great truth here. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Remember, though one of the children was first before in terms of birth order, God did start with Sarai. The promise came to her through Abraham. It's Abram and Sarai first, not second. God's promise and covenant was first to her. But interestingly enough, as we break into that history today, we'll be reminded how man has a way of grabbing religion, law, legalism, any other formula other than through God's promise in Jesus Christ to seemingly try and fulfill their way to God when God said, I made the way to you. Keep that in mind as we continue to read. Verse 24, which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. You know what Jerusalem? That is the new Jerusalem, the new destination for the believer, for those that are adopted, heirs of God. He says, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. That's who the true mother is. You see, when you're born again, you're an adopted son, he's bringing every type of allegorical, relational, uh, narrative type of part into his story to say, can you really just get, you gotta get this. 
I've made an argument for grace through sentiment. I've made an argument through argument through logic. I've made, I've made arguments that have been scriptural. Now I'm going to just say, hey, maybe I can just paint a picture for you. Maybe I can just... Just rearrange this all, take the Bible. Now, remember, we don't want to spiritualize the Bible and try to manipulate it into our own way. And that, that will just mess up and break down, and it'll still be your way of doing things. What he's doing is taking the truth of the Word of God, and he's bringing it into a way of delivery that doesn't change the meaning, nor the doctrine, nor the theology, but rather delivers the message of, hey... You need to believe on the promise of God through Abraham and then through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to believe in Jesus like you did. And you need to stay believing there. And you need to continue to look to the new Jerusalem because that's where we live together as believers. He says in verse 27 down through the rest of the chapter, chapter 4 it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest it not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Oh, those that are barren, those that are lost, those that truly do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Because you still, when you understand what God has done for you, Verse number 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. But as then he was born after the flesh, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Whew, that's when you dance. That's when you say, yeah. See, God makes a clear line right down the middle. Those that believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ are of the free woman. Those that are not in believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as salvation, you're of the bond woman. And there are many children that belong to the bond woman. It says in verse number 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bond woman, but of the free woman. Think of what's going on here. Think of what Paul is teaching them. After chapters 3 and chapters 4 have gone through all the arguments and shown the superiority of grace, we realize, hey, this allegory argument for grace is powerful. The allegory argument is everything. The allegory argument that we see for grace is what we want to touch on, which, what we want to follow. Paul's saying, hey, here's the comparison Salvation by grace alone. They're saying the addition of the law. There's a spiritual birth. They believe in the flesh birth. It's the bond woman versus the free woman. It's the old Jerusalem versus the new Jerusalem. It's Ishmael who is plan B. Isaac who is plan A. It's constantly going back and forth to rehearse the Old Testament but bring it to the New Testament and say, hey, we are the children of promise. We are not the children of bondage. We are free. We are not in bondage. Paul says, hey, there was two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And he explains everything that those two births mean. The physical birth of Ishmael and how he was the one that had to be, as man does, take things into his own hands. And when Sarai says, take Hagar, he takes Hagar, and now Abram is now father, and he goes, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, that was not the spiritual birth of the children of God that was supposed to be brought. You see, the law that brought death clearly showed that that physical birth would bring death, and a representation of going out of order, going over the top of God's promise, doing things that of course, we all do in a way, but when we were lost, we did it all the time, making our way to heaven somehow, some way, in some physical, religious way. Those two sons represent, of course, how the law brings death and how the spirit brings life. Hagar, he brings in Hagar into the whole thing. He brings Hagar, who represents the law. She is the inferior person to the wife that truly is promised. And we know that Sarai is the wife. Sarah she was the first. She was the one. She was free. She wasn't a slave like Hagar. She wasn't the wife that had got brought into things. You know what? 
Sometimes we don't realize in the depth of all of this that Hagar was assigned something to do on behalf of Sarai and Abram and in her responsibility, hey, she may say, hey, I just did what I was told. But she, again, used by God to show in this allegory and show through the truth of the word of God that that physical birth does only get you a physical birth. It's the spiritual birth that saves you. It's being born again, like Garrett Crawley was saying. And hey, listen, people may say in that day, Lord, Lord, but you do not know him. And he says, I do not know you. That would be that physical birth only. He also shows in this allegory some other things. Like in verse number 27, when he quotes the Old Testament, he says, hey, let me, let me quote Isaiah. Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Hey, Israel, in the Lord, you understand what you have in him? Again, Paul's saying, here's the truth. I know the truth might hurt you, but I've got to point out there's two sons, there's two wives, there's two mothers, and there's two, two ways to go. The right way and the wrong way. There's an old Jerusalem. There's a new Jerusalem. And of course, as Christians, we're like Isaac. We're looking at this and going, okay, where do we fit in here? Well, we're of the free woman. And we're like Isaac as the children of the promise by grace, the covenant of grace, which is pictured in Sarah. Everything that you and I would line up. You go study your Bible. God does not miss a trick. God lines everything up according to his word. God cannot go against what he has promised and what he said. And oftentimes we don't know how we landed here until we go back and break down what the Old Testament says, what the Old, Old Testament is teaching. Think of this. And just think of just Abraham's, Abraham's life real quick. And then I will just make a couple of applications for our lives in this. Think of this. Abraham, at 75 years old, he was called by God to go to Canaan. Then a few years later, 10 years later, he was promised a son. And the promised son had not arrived. Sarah became impatient. And of course, that's when Abraham went into Hagar to try and have a son out of Genesis 16. At 86 years old, a yearish later, Hagar gets pregnant and Sarah gets jealous. Tough times, of course, come. Ishmael, he comes. Now what happens? Many years pass. But at 99 years old, what happens with Abraham and God? God speaks to Abraham and he says in Genesis 17 and 18, Hey, you are going to have a son and that son is going to be by Sarah. Okay, that sounds good. At 100 years old, who was born? Isaac is born. And now, in your history lesson, tying it together with the doctrine of what the Word of God's teaching, Isaac is now born. So, think of this. 1986. 1986. When Abraham is 86 years old, to the time when Isaac is born. Ishmael, Isaac are 14 years apart. You haven't heard a word, nor does the Bible have any accounting of Ishmael being a problem child at all. But what happens when Isaac shows up? Now there's a problem. It's kind of like when you're born again. The world and the devil don't mess with you too much because he's already got you. You get saved and born again, and all of a sudden he starts knocking on the door and he says, Hey, hey. Do you know who you really have believed in? You sure that you want to believe in him? You sure that you're born again? You sure that you have eternal security? You sure your sin can? Wait a minute, you need to become legalistic. You need to become a little bit more religiously minded and you need to start obeying what man says again even if you think that you're a new creature in Christ. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You see, Ishmael comes into the mix. Once Isaac is born, we'll look at that here in a minute, but three years later, the Bible gives us an account of when, of course, the Jews make a big deal at three years old of being weaned off the mom. And what happens? Ishmael shows up and starts mocking him and mocking them. And that's when 
the head's butt. That's when the contest is on in the, in the, in the fighting and the argument. And hey, Hagar, Ishmael, you got to go. You see, we look at things sometimes just on the, on the, on the um, earthly part or, or just on just the, the, the surfacey part. And we, we think, okay, that's all that's going on. And we forget that when we get into a spiritual battle, now we go, wow, there must be more stuff going on. It's going on for all of you. There is a spiritual battle after you, born again believer, and if you haven't figured that out, just please trust me, it's in the Bible. And the battle that's going on in these churches of Galatia, the Galatians, is the same battle you're wrestling with almost 2,000 years later. Do I obey man or do I obey God? Do I study the Bible and get really deep into the Word of God so the Holy Spirit of God runs my life? Or do I just let man run my life? Do I just take the easy way out, the lazy way out, and say, yeah, I know I'm saved, but maybe I can just kind of cruise a little bit. The spiritual battle is real and Ishmael's around to mess with you. And so Abram had to send Ishmael away according to the word of God. That's the allegory argument in Abraham's life going from when he's 75 and called by God to go to Canaan to when he's got a son that's three years old and he's 103 years old. How would you like to have a three-year-old at 103? How's that sound, everybody? I think that's Lee and Joni Tiller, isn't it? He was in first service, so I'm safe right now. Wait a minute. Oh, this is on YouTube. What am I thinking? <laughs> Lee, I didn't mean, Lee, I'm sorry. You think about that. The neat part about it is, just like Lee, Abraham went after it hard from that point on. And he got his son ready for the work that he had to do. And he had to battle some battles. Abraham had to. The point in all this is that when we recognize there's something going on more than just the surface, we need to hear the truth. Somebody needs to come up and speak the truth to you. The word of God, you need to let it speak to you. And that grace and truth that came by Jesus, John chapter number one, the law did come by Moses, but grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the next few minutes, let me just show you three simple things. I tried to show you three or four things that would be personally applicable to us because the truth does hurt sometimes, but it's okay. I need to hear the truth. So the first one here is this. The truth hurts. Sometimes the truth hurts. There is no amount of religion or legalism that can breathe life into a dead sinner. Stare at that for a minute. Consider this. As I mentioned a little bit ago, and you think about what happened. God's way was a certain way to do things. His law versus grace battle was clear. Bigger picture. I'll introduce and I'll show you the law and how that cannot save you, but that I need to put it before you so you understand who I am. It is going to be grace. Grace that's going to start the covenant. Grace that's going to finish the covenant. My grace will be in the midst of my promises. And when you consider how Isaac was delivered in light of Ishmael, we realize that Ishmael was the religious, legalistic way of somehow following the law to get the sun going to breathe some life into the Jewish people. But legalism and religion, it, all it does is bur- just give birth to more flesh and more flesh fellowship. See, Hagar versus Sarah means, again, she's the law going up against grace. And there's no amount of religion or legalism that can breathe life into a dead sinner. The spiritual death is what religion and legalism brings to a person who is lost. What does it do to someone who's saved? It puts them in a position where they think, hey, where's the Holy Spirit? How can the Word of God work? Oh, let me get the Word of God and get about another 20 Bible lessons, and then I'll figure out how to mechanically show people. No, 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 no. 
Right from the very beginning, understand the truth hurts when you tell people your way to God nah, is not going to work. You cannot breathe life into a dead sinner. It says up here in Genesis, I believe chapter number 21, I use that a little bit. And if you want to use it and turn there, if not, the verses will be up on the screen. The first one I have for you is Genesis 21, verse number 2. I'll read verse number one, it goes to two, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived and bare Adam, a son in his old age, a, excuse me, Abraham a, as a son in the old, old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. He circumcised him on the eighth day as God had commanded him. Of course, his name means joy because he brought them so much joy. Understand this. The first way to do things to try and find some way was wrong, and the truth has to be delivered. And I just got to tell you, look, when you see that the truth is delivered in a way that's proper, and yeah, sometimes it hurts, it still brings joy when you hear the truth of it. It, it shows that Isaac really was born of God's power, and it wasn't some orchestrated thing of man. That's really, really important because you and I think, whoa, wait a minute. I could take this into my hand, own hands. Galatians 4, verse number 4 says this. It's up on the screen. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. It says in verse number 5, I know you're right there if you just want to turn back to that. It says, to redeem that we're under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The truth hurts when you are told, hey, that religion and that way of doing things, that legalism, that does not breathe life into a dead sinner. It's the Holy Spirit of God that comes into the believer when you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. That's what it means when you're a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I've said it before. I don't look for a change in someone's life that's lost. I look for a new birth in someone's life that is lost. You need to become new. A new birth certificate. And I have, and any of you would, I'm sure, attest to that. I thank God I have a new life in Christ. 38 years ago almost, called in the name of the Lord, my life completely changed. I was a new creature in Christ. The Holy Spirit of God came into me and breathed into me life because I was spiritually dead. The, other, the next one is the truth hurts when you look at it this way. That there's no scenario possible where the flesh and spirit can compromise to live together. Let me say that again. There's no scenario possible where the flesh and the spirit can compromise to live together. But do we not try this so often? We try to get a little bit for our flesh and it's okay to have a good time in things, especially uh, what the Bible teaches about enjoying the life that you have in the Lord. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything on that. I'm talking about the, the pleasures of sin for a season in my flesh, along with the Holy Spirit of God. They cannot live a compromised life together because you've got to compromise something. You've got to compromise some doctrine. You've got to compromise the Holy Spirit in listening to him. You've got to quench the Holy Spirit of God in order to make the flesh happy. And when you do that, you've made a compromise. I know because I've done it enough myself. That's why Paul warns us. That's why the Bible teaches us. Again, we're walking into chapter 5 and chapter 6 of Galatians. And, and you got to get game on here because this is what the Holy Spirit of God says he would love to do for you and for me to encompass and fill and let fruit just truly flow out of your life. There's no scenario possible where the flesh and the spirit can compromise to live together. You, can't com you just have to say, I'm going all the way with the Holy Spirit of God and I'm not going to quench him and I'm not going to grieve him you know what happens when you are suffering in grief from the loss of someone? Think of the Holy Spirit of God losing your heart for him. Are you saying lose salvation? I didn't say that. The Holy Spirit of God's right there, and he wants you to spend time in the word of God, and he wants you to just 
embrace his presence that's inside of you. To have time with him, to pray with him, and, and then you say, no, I don't, I can't. Do you not think that God of the universe that is inside of you grieves? That's what the scripture says. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. They can't do, they can't. There's no scenario possible where the flesh and the Holy Spirit can compromise life and have live a compromised way. Very simply up on the screen it says this. I quote a little bit of Genesis 21 again. I used the place here where... <laughs> Eh, this is when the conflict comes. Go ahead and put it up there, my brother. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham. She's the mother of him, and he's mocking. Mocking the celebration of Isaac being weaned from his mother. He's mocking God's son. He's mocking God's promise. You don't do something about that right there in that compromise Watch out, because you know what they did? They dealt with it in verse number 10. It says this, Wherefore she said unto Abraham, We got to get on it. Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Stand up, make a stand for your family, and don't let that stuff happen. Because the compromise is just a little. I know. You can't compromise the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We all know. I'm not talking to an empty crowd here that doesn't understand. We know. Because the truth hurts when I'm told it by God. It hurts from Him. That verse is quoted in Galatians 4. It's up on the screen. It says this. Nevertheless, what say it? The Scripture Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman should not be heir with the son of the free woman. So changing the terminology, but it, it clearly is the same thing, a synonym for the heir with Abraham is the son of the free woman. Who's the free woman? Sarah. We are the sons of the free woman. We are headed to the new Jerusalem. And then lastly, where the truth hurts is this. And this is clear, each one of these. I, I use a little bit of a negative connotation today just to, because the scripture then brings us to what do we need to do stuff. There's no freedom for the old nature to live in the law, to look good while in bondage. What do you mean? Let me read that again. There's no... There's just no, and I should have put the word I-S in there. There's, there is, no. No way that the old nature can live in the law to look good. You know what I mean. I'll clarify. I remember first getting saved and going to church for the first few years up at First Bible Baptist Church in Rochester. I remember the, some of the legalistic twinges didn't know. I just say, hey, tell me what to do and I'll do it. If you didn't carry your Bible a certain way, you were looked on differently. You had to carry a Bible, had to make sure you had a Bible. If you walked into the church building without the Bible, oh boy. So guess what? Don't read the Bible all week long, but carry the Bible looking good. Now I just carry the phone. That hides a lot for me. I'm really cool with that. They give me an iPad or something like that. Used to always wear a certain set of clothes. And by the way, I like nice clothes. I wasted a lot of money. Well, no, I spent a lot of good money on nice clothes. I had to slow down. I got three kids and... But the clothes on the outside to look good made me feel good. Made me feel good and made me look good. Also, my behaviors. Argue with my wife in the car on the way. My kids were taking notes. They showed me later, even when they were five years old. Mom and dad fought February 11th, 2019. But get out of the car. Walk in. 
instead of stopping and saying, please forgive me, Cheryl. I just walked in looking good. Those are safe ones. I just used some safe ones today. You see, in Genesis chapter number 16, there's a couple there, and I used all those verses to just study it through, but I'll just put up a couple. And I believe I had the idea of the context here. Verse number four, I did highlight that one. And here's this whole idea coming back. Being out of order, doing things to appear on the outside. That's what Abram and Sarai did. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. See, what am I showing you? In that setting where they got things out of order and still, as I said, that, hey, the truth hurts. There's no freedom for the old nature to live in the law. Somehow we think we can go with it for a while, but then God just says, no, 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 no. And God will bring it to remembrance. He'll, the Lord will judge between me and thee. I can sit and blame everybody else, but it's on me. Abram and Sarai could have blamed God. Where, where's the baby? It was on them. And the Lord judged between me and thee because God showed her that it was wrong. It says in Galatians chapter number four to finish out. So then, brethren, the last verse in the chapter, I love this verse, it leads beautiful into chapter 5 next week. We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. You're free. You're free. Free to live in Jesus Christ. Free to live, for by grace are you saved through faith. Free to live in faith. Free to live your life according to his will and his way and his truth and his goodness. And I promise you one simple thing. In the hiccups of life, when you do have those places where you do sin and fall away, it won't be because you're pleasing the old nature or going after a place that has no freedom or you're compromising or trying to compromise in the flesh and the spirit. It's saying, I am of the free woman. I am of the holy God of the universe, and I'm born again as a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That's my life in Christ. I'm free to live in him. It says up here with, the, with our finishing right here, God's told us the truth again. <laughs> again. He told us again. He told it the truth from his word, not from me. His word speaks for itself that we are free to live in faith. Please join me in a word of prayer as we finish out our service. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Oh my, thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your promise, your covenant. We are free. And we have been born not of the bondwoman, but of the free woman. We've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation, for your redemption. Thank you. Thank you so much. I pray in just our time of prayer over the next minute or two, and it's just time to defrag with you, but then walk unto you and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, free my mind and my heart, my soul and my spirit to take this allegory of Paul from the word of God, from the Holy Spirit, and make a commitment, a decision to live free, a free life by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.